So this is style and structure disentanglement for image manipulation. I'm presenting this on behalf of these folks here from UC Berkeley and Adobe. Now this talk will focus on these two words, style and structure. Now I know they're kind of difficult to define, so we'll try to consider how they may be appropriately used in different supervisory scenarios. So here are some common supervisory scenarios. So the first is just pair translation. And this is in some sense the easiest because you're given many things. You're given two domains, domain A should be the input and domain B should be the output. And this kind of looks like something that would correspond to style. For example, here we have input label maps and output facades. Now what you're also given is instances. So you have instance zero, instance one, paired examples um, between these two domains. And so this also gives you the structure in this setup. Okay, but you may not always be so fortunate. Uh, many times you may um, be working in an unpaired translation scenario where you only have set level supervision. So here you do have domain A and domain B. So again, you have style somewhat taken care of for you, but what you don't have is structure or correspondence. So your learning system ends up having to discover this. Now we can move even further to the right here. We can just think about having an unlabeled collection of images. And here you're not really given anything. It's all up to you to discover both the style and the structure. So this setup, uh, this talk will um, discuss the second and third scenarios. Let's first start off with unpaired translation. So here, uh, showing an example where you're given um, a set of horses and a set of zebras, and that's in your training set. Now at test time, the emergent behavior that you want is um, a sensible translation. You want your horse to uh, be sensibly translated into a zebra. And what do we mean by um, sensible? Well, clearly the horse um, or the zebra in the middle here is um, much more sensible than the one on the top or the bottom because those are in completely different poses. Um, they don't correspond at all to the horse on the left. So how is this typically enforced? Well, the kind of typical way is to is to do um, cycle consistency. So this is the cycle consistency loss used in CycleGAN, popularized by papers in 2017, such as CycleGAN, and also often used in, in, in many subsequent works as well. Um, and this um, is good because it can um, someone ensure that, it's trying to ensure that you can get back to the input horse and not into some other completely random horse. But the problem here is that it's perhaps too restrictive um, because while, the horse in the middle here is, is good. These other ones are also just as good. We don't exactly care about the exact um, kind of texture on that specific input horse. We'd be just as happy with a white horse or a spotted horse as, as well. Okay, so we don't need ex um, back translation exactly. Let's think about what we actually do want. So perhaps what we want is a loss or representation where the parts are interchangeable. Um, you know, if you started with a horse head, you just want some sort of horse head back doesn't need to be the exact same one. But what you do care is that it's a head and not um, its posterior or its belly or its, or its legs. So you want um, the different parts to be differentiated, but the, uh, the kind of style or the textures are interchangeable. So in other words, we'd like a representation that's invariant to the horizontal dim dimension and um, sensitive to the vertical dimension here. Okay, so how do we turn this intuition into code? Let's, let's see what we can do. So we'll have a generator that takes a horse and tries to generate a zebra. We want it to take the appearance of a zebra so we can use a discriminator for that. And from here, we're looking to deal with, uh, get, to get correspondence out. And so what we want is if we take corresponding patches between the input and output, we want them to be close together in contrast to other patches in the input image, okay? So the corresponding patches should have high similarity in contrast to other patches. Now, um, this actually lends itself naturally to um, a contrastive learning formulation. And I'll show you how here. So what we wanna do is learn an embedding such that this is the case. So we can take these two patches and extract a feature that's gonna be Z for the zebra's head and Z plus for the horse's head. And we can take a dot product or cosine similarity and we want that to be high, especially relative to the dot product between the, um, the zebra's head and all the other parts of the horse. And in fact, if we do a softmax over this, we can just use our standard cross-entropy loss, uh, which we've been using you know, forever, and 
that gives us this, um, this property that we want, and it can help us do structured prediction. Now, this is known in the literature as the um, info NCE loss, and a very um, nice property of it is that it's a lower bound on mutual information. So an alternative interpretation is that you're trying to maximize the mutual information between input and output patches. Okay, now um, a bit about how we code this. We don't literally take crops of patches and put them through the network. We have something a bit more efficient. What we can do is take the generator and break it up into an encoder and decoder, and we can reuse the encoder and uh, run it on the zebra. And from there, we can take activations in intermediate layers of the encoders on the horses and zebras. And um, what this means is that if you go um, deeper into the, uh, the network, you're actually, and you take an activation, that actually corresponds to a larger patch in the uh, image. And if you use a shallower layer, you use, um, you're using effectively a smaller patch. And then different spatial locations uh, within the activations correspond to different spatial locations for the patches. So by doing this, we're looking at all sorts of um, scales of patches. We're even looking at um, one by one patches, which is just pixel level distributions um, up to much larger patches. Okay, so what we end up doing is um, applying this in a multi-layer patchwise um, fashion. Okay, so I think one interesting uh, property of this is that our method does not rely on any fixed similarity metric, such as L1 or a perceptual loss. So this loss ends up um, being learned. Um, so we're getting kind of cross-domain uh, visual similarity in an emergent manner. And another good property, I think, is that this enables one-sided translation. So it means we're not taking the zebra and going back to the horse, um, right? We're kind of saving that whole, that whole path back. And that ends up giving us a lighter memory footprint and faster runtime so that uh, we can actually train much faster. Okay, so there's one more um, additional term here. So what we've proposed so far is a contrastive loss between the input horse and the output zebra. There's another trick called the identity regularization trick uh, where you can take an output or take a, a ground truth zebra and put in the generator um, and, and, and put the same loss on the input and output here. And this is to encourage the generator um, from, or rather discourage it from making unnecessary changes. If you already have a zebra in, you don't need to really change many pixels. You should um, be a little more conservative. Now our full system has both these losses, um, both for the horse as well as the identity loss regularization. And we call it contrastive unpaired translation or cut for short. And what we found qualitatively is that it's a bit more flexible than CycleGAN, and it's also faster to train due to its one-sided nature. Now we can make it even faster um, by removing the identity loss regularization term. In this case, we're going to turn up the contrastive loss by a um, larger factor, and this causes the system to be more conservative, um, and it's actually even faster than cut. So I can show you the training time here. The uh, y-axis is training time, so lower is better. On the left, we see cycle GAN, which is shown in yellow. On the right, we see cut and fast cut. And they're 60% and 160% faster than cycle GAN. So fast cut is more than 2x faster than cycle GAN to train. Um, here's some other image trans unpaired image translation methods. The two-sided methods, which require cycle consistency, take um, either the same or more time than cycle GAN. And the one-sided methods um, take much less time, and our fast cut model ends up being equal to those in terms of runtime. Okay, let's look at some results. So here's a comparison between cut, which is our method, and cycle GAN, um, which is a baseline. And we see that in some instances, our system um, feels more flexible and liberal to add the zebra texture, where cycle GAN is a bit more, a bit more conservative. Um, so here's some other unpaired image translation methods. And you see that I think cycle GAN and cut look a bit better than them. And here's our fast cut method, which is a bit more conservative and looks a bit more like cycle again. Okay, so what do we mean by uh, flexible or conservative? Well, I think here's a little study that we did that looks at the training data in the horse and zebra data set. So here are some horse images and here are some zebra images. And what you see is that the zebras are actually, they're bigger, they're more close up for whatever reason, perhaps it's photographer bias, uh, wanting to show off the stripe patterns, 
um, there are just more zebra pixels than there are horse pixels. And you can actually count the pixels by writing a semantic segmentation algorithm and just counting up the, the, the pixels. There's um, basically twice, twice as many zebra pixels than horse pixels. OK, so now we're going to be given an input image of a horse. And out comes kind of a really a philosophical question. Should the translated zebras actually match the input horse distribution or the, or the zebra distribu training distribution? Well, to me, it's actually unclear. It may be a matter of taste, but I can tell you what happens empirically. So CycleGAN ends up being more conservative. And you can see that it tries to match the input horse distribution, whereas CUT gives a bit more spatial slack um, and allows the discriminator to be a little happier, and it better matches the, the zebra distribution. For example, you can see on this example up top, this zebra looks like it had a nice, um, a really nice lunch. So its, it's belly is looking nice and full. OK, and fast cut, you can see, is something kind of in between that's a little bit more uh, conservative. OK, so we can also run this system on other um, translation problems, such as cat to dog, summer to winter, et cetera. And so just like CycleGAN um, has served as you know, a really powerful system that you could just pull from GitHub and run, um, I would encourage you to, to try cut um, as a baseline as well, because it can um, do these tasks and it, it runs faster. OK, so we kind of motivated this talk by saying that this system should be good for um, discovering correspondence. Now, we would actually like to try to measure that. And to do that, we can use the semantic segmentation score um, to evaluate the correspondence. So you can start with um, this label map. We can run the image-to-image um, -image translation model, for example, CUT or CycleGAN, to get um, a, uh, an image. And we can put it through a pre-trained semantic segmentation model and check how much the input and the output agree. And we can measure this with mean IOU. OK, so here, higher is better. We see that um, CycleGAN and other two-sided methods get these yellow values. Here are the one-sided methods, which are designed to be faster. Um, but uh, many seem to not be as good as discovering correspondence, except GCGAN, which performs very strongly. Um, and here's cut and fast. So you see that cut is able to um, discover kind of stronger correspondences than CycleGAN or GCGAN. Now, um, in developing this project, there were a few um, kind of key elements that we found. And one kind of surprising one, I think, is this matter of how you sample the negatives. So the drawing I've given you so far is, is like this. The corresponding patches should be positives and pulled together. And the negatives are drawn from other patches within this um, exact, in, this specific input image. OK, so these are kind of internally drawn patches from um, internal to this input image. But there's really nothing keeping us from drawing external patches either. Um, after all, intuitively, we, we don't want um, the zebra head to be close to any random patch, um, any random horse patch in the trains. But somewhat surprisingly, we found actually this ends up hurting performance. And so our hypothesis is that if you take another horse, another random part of a horse, um, it's maybe not that helpful. It's not any more helpful than the uh, random parts of the horse from the spe specific training image. And you might run into uh, false negatives. For example, you might grab another horse's head, um, and that might cause some problems in learning. Um, so here's just an example of um, results for internal versus external patches. Here's a result with internal patches. Here's with external. And you see very clear mode collapse when we're, doing, when we're using external patches. OK, and this uh, got us thinking a bit more. And so um, one thing to note is that internal patch statistics are um, extremely powerful, and they've been used in, um, to great effect in the past you know, few decades. So there's this kind of very seminal work from Afros and Young and Afros and Freeman about generating uh, textures um, simply by using internal, internal patches. And kind of more modern work is ESSR and SYNGAN, which got um, that's paper in ICCV, which is learning to do super resolution or learning um, all sorts of image manipulation tasks simply by training on a single image. And um, inspired by this, we wanted to see if we could do this for, for our system as well. 
So um, here, we're going to train uh, um, unpaired translation, and the two domains are simply going to be a single image each. So we can call this uh, SimCut colloquially. Okay, so we have a painting as an input, and we're going to have a reference photo um, as our output domain. We can have a discriminator that looks at random patches from uh, the translated photo and the reference photo to check that they're in the same distribution. And we could run our contrastive loss for correspondence. Okay, so this actually corresponds somewhat closely to uh, photorealistic styl stylization. So we can compare to those methods as well. Um, so this is a uh, Gattis, which is kind of more of an artistic style transfer. And you see that it looks kind of cool, but really it's not um, not realistic. Here's a more um, modern framework called Strats, uh, which is inspired by Gattis. Um, and it looks a, a bit cleaner, but still really not matching the reference photo statistics, I would say. And here's WCT2, which is specifically aimed to be a photorealistic style transfer method. And on the left, we'll show our method. And I believe our method kind of looks um, kind of much more realistic than, than uh, the baseline and much closer to the reference photo. And on the right, we can show how CycleGAN does. Um, so it has some nice textures, but some errors in the reflections. And so I can do this again with this input painting and this reference photo. On the right is Gaddis, Strats, WCT2, and then on the left, I'll show our method. And then on the right, I'll show um, cycle again. Okay, so I'll just show some uh, random results from our method. So here's a painting and a photo. Here's our result. Here's another pair. And another. And one more. Okay, so here we've proposed a contrastive loss uh, for the purpose of cross domain structural correspondence. It doesn't rely on any predefined distance metrics such as perceptual loss or L1, and it enables one sided translation in the unpaired translation case. Um, so you can try our, our code and, and models here. But there are some drawbacks. So we're still relying on domain labels for style. And we can only do one predefined task. So for those single image translation um, tasks, those results I think are pretty cool, but it literally takes half an hour to, or an hour to train and you can only do that, that one image. Okay, so we'd like to try to relax some of these constraints and move towards um, purely unsupervised training where you're not given um, even domain labels, you're just given an image collection. Okay, so what are some desired properties that we want if we were to learn on these, um, these images? Uh, well, I think we would like to have, uh, for kind of graphics purposes, a representation that's amenable to certain downstream manipulations. Um, and some examples are maybe we want to edit the structure of the image. We'd like to change the global style or feel of the image. Um, we like to perform image interpolations or similarly uh, vector arithmetic. But uh, really the most important property that that we need is that the image needs to be recoverable from the code. Because if um, you get a code and you don't get your image back, you're not editing your image, you're editing some, some other image. Okay, now notice that um, one thing we don't really care about is uh, random sampling. Like that's not something that we actually need to do for editing a specific image. Um, and so uh, while GANs kind of have cool emergent properties like smooth latent spaces, um, they're trained with random sampling, and that's not a property that we need. What we need is that the image needs to be at fir first and foremost recoverable. And so we're gonna train with that in mind first. So we're going to code an image, decode it, and we want it back, okay? And uh, we also want the output to look realistic. Now, from here, we'd like this code to be useful for downstream manipulations. So we're going to hypothesize that if we are able to disentangle it into um, something that corresponds to structure and something that corresponds to style, we'll be able to do so. Uh, so this is a hypothesis and design decision we're making that'll hopefully be validated later in the talk. Okay, now how do we actually enforce that um, something corresponds to style? Well, one thing we can do is um, swapping. So we can uh, encode a different image, in this case, um, St. Basil's Cathedral, 
we can attach its style code to the structure code of Notre Dame and decode it and hopefully get something like this. Okay, and we want that to look realistic, so we'll put a discriminator there. Okay, so the idea here is that we're using swapping as a pretext task, and that should hopefully induce a representation that's um, useful later. Now, how do we actually enforce, um, enforce this? So number one, we have to define what we mean by style. And uh, number two, we have to kind of figure out how to actually um, enforce this. And for that, we're inspired by older work by, by Eulish, and Eulish is really the kind of like the father of texture. And so back in the 60s, he was thinking about, from an analytical standpoint, what makes two textures similar? And his hypothesis was that if you had some sort of true infinite texture and you grab two patches from it, if you could find the right statistics for them, then those statistics would describe um, how humans actually perceive uh, the fact that these two kind of patches uh, appear to be the same. Okay, we're inspired by this and we'd like to um, see if we can kind of turn this into, into some code that works. So we're going to take an image and take two uh, patches from there. We're going to get statistics of those patches and then compare them with an MLP and also ask, do these two patches come from the same or different image? Okay, so you can think of the, um, the front end, F, as um, extracting kind of the relevant features for this task. And the MLP in the back end is doing something that's kind of second order. It's looking at co-occurrences over these features um, and trying to figure out whether or not they belong in, in the same image. Okay, and in fact, we can just play this game together. So you already know that these two come from the same image. What if I give you these two, these two patches? Okay, um, okay, I guess we don't have a live audience, but hopefully you're guessing that they come from different images and indeed they do. How about these two patches? Okay, um, they come from the same image. How about these two? They come from different images. How about these two? Okay, well, I actually hopefully tricked you in this case. They actually come from different images, even though if you look at these, they look uh, quite similar, okay? And so um, this is actually an output of our system. We took the structure image shown on the top right here and mixed it uh, with the style image on the left to get this result. Um, so the approach we're taking is that we're saying that if two images have the same co-occurrence statistics over a relevant set of patch features, then um, they can we, can, we can say that in some sense, they have a similar or the same style. Okay, and so one kind of implementation detail that we found important is that we're not actually grabbing just a single patch. We're going to grab several patches from the um, reference style photo. Um, and then we're gonna check if um, a patch on the output actually belongs there. So we have kind of multiple context patches to get a uh, kind of distribution over of textures from the input image. And we're um, kind of calling that or defining that as what we refer to as style. And so we call this a patch co-occurrence discriminator. It's looking to see if um, orderless patches belong in the same image or not. Okay. Let's see how it works. So if I take Notre Dame and stylize it with itself, that's, that's the exact same as autoencoding. I should hopefully get my image back. But if I apply it to a different image, I can get this. And here are a whole bunch of different style images. And what we see is that uh, it's the, the changes are, I think, non-trivial. It's not just doing um, like color histogram um, matching. Um, it's actually um, doing a little bit more than that, which is, I think, encouraging if you look at these red arrows. Now we can take the exact same algorithm and run it on um, a different data set. For example, we can grab uh, images of bedrooms from Elson. And we see that while it's not perfect, generally it finds correspondence. The bed sheets go to the bed sheets, the wall color goes to the wall color, um, and the drapes go to the drapes. And we can try this for outdoor images as well. So you can see that uh, vegetation kind of transfers to the ground and the clouds transfer over to the sky, or if we take a more desert-like scene, we can transfer those textures onto the appropriate regions as well. 
Okay. Um, and so, so far we just decided to define um, kind of distributions like uh, co-occurrences of past statistics as, as style. But um, we can also try to run a perceptual test for, for this as well and see if um, you and people agree. So here we're going to take this structure image and stylize it. Here's our result. Now here's if you use um, a generative network such as um, StyleGAN or more modern uh, StyleGAN2. And the reason these results don't look as good as maybe mixing results that you've seen are that um, the, you have to do this projection step. Um, these are not just randomly sampled images that you can easily mix. You have to find the images first. And it turns out doing that step is, is quite difficult and um, the mixing results can, can get worse by, because of this step. We can also use um, style transfer methods such as Strats or WCT2 shown on the right. And we actually went on Turk and we asked, which one do you think is more similar in style? And we would usually, sh we would always show our method, the, um, the style image, as well as a, a baseline method. And the order of our method versus the baseline method would be randomized. So they would be choosing left or right in a two alternative force choice test. And what we see is that our method is chosen more often than the generative models, as well as um, the style transfer methods. Okay, so this is great. Uh, at least we're able to do the single task of swapping or um, sometimes referred to as photorealistic stylization. But this was not our goal to begin with. This was just a pretext task. What we want to see is if we get anything out for free. Do we get emergent capabilities such as um, editing the style of the image? Uh, if, can we kind of mess with the structure or can we do vector arithmetic or even find a way to do um, image translation? So does this representation end up um, showing us these free capabilities? Well, let's give it a try. So here we're going to try to directly edit the style code. The style code is um, almost like a matrix it's basically a very skinny tensor. So um, it's H by W by C, where C is quite small. Um, and so you have some spatial regions to edit. And so we can extract the structure code at this position, which corresponds to the sky, and see if we can overwrite um, certain regions on the mountains. And turns out we were able to. We were able to remove some mountains here. OK, and we can also um, do kind of more global things. So we can take the whole data set, we can encode it and run PCA. And uh, this is inspired by this recent work called uh, GANSpace by Harkonnen et al. And this can find just interesting directions in, in the latent space. And we show this in the UI on the right. So we have a preview of each principal axis and we can just try to see if it slides around. And we see indeed it gives um, decent looking results. And I feel like this was not guaranteed. When we were training, we didn't um, slide around or vary anything smoothly. We just encoded and decoded images as well as swapped codes. So I think there was no guarantee that the space would actually be densely filled in a meaningful way, but that's something that just emerges out uh, for free. So let me just give you a, a longer kind of demo. So um, Taysom built this really cool UI. So we can take Horseshoe Bend in Arizona we can change the global properties through manipulating the sliders. Okay, we can add some snow. You can see the mountains are actually kind of growing in the back, which is interesting. Here we're taking the sky and using it to remove some mountains, but we can also do the reverse and uh, grow some mountains as well here in the middle of the image. And we can take the water, and if we want, we can just go ahead and scrub away this, this mountain. If we want just more water to swim in. Okay, and so this is fun to play with. Um, and here's just an additional example of taking this uh, input scene and morphing it in different ways to give snow or go to the sunset time or uh, go to nighttime, you see stars appear. Uh, we can also train on different data sets, such as uh, here's some faces of animals. And here are results of, um, so here are two input images, and here's, I think Taysan just kind of walked around um, and explored the, 
the latent space using the UI, uh, finding kind of different points that he liked. And you see that um, all these animals kind of have the same pose and we're able to kind of change the species on them and explore the space in a fun way. And so this is done kind of free form in the UI without labels. Now, an interesting thing is that if you do have labels, you can actually apply them um, after the fact, uh, sort of on the fly. And what I mean here is, for example, you may have uh, images of um, portraits of people as well as um, paintings of people. And you can just throw them all into one training set and use our method to, um, to train. So you can train without any labels. And then after the fact, you can use the labels to find a direction that goes from um, paintings to real images. Okay, so you can define your tasks after you do the training. If you do unsupervised training, and then later you can sprinkle a little bit of labels on top and see what you get. And so um, here I'm morphing to um, something that looks more realistic. Okay, so I'll just morph between them. Okay, so I think in this talk we've discussed how uh, we can use past statistics um, in some, a few interesting ways. So we can use um, co-occurrences of orderless patches, um, and that can give us something that uh, corresponds to, to style. So I think um, this discriminator that we've used, this patch co-occurrence discriminator, could be used for um, you know, other follow-on projects as well, uh, but we showed its effectiveness here in the swapping autoencoder. And we also use a patch-wise contrastive loss for structure. So here we're not, um, the patches are not orderless. The order really matters. In fact, uh, we're specifically relying on corresponding and non-corresponding patches, putting the corresponding ones together away from the non-corresponding ones. And we found that um, that could be used effectively in an unpaired image translation scenario. Okay, here are links to the projects, as well as my collaborators. Um, and I especially like to point out Taysan Park, who is the uh, first author of, of both these projects. Okay, thank you very much.